Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. My mom's with us today. And yeah, every time my mom's here, you're, you're going to hear me gush about her, okay? Like, it's just the way it is. Like, I have the best mom in the world, um, and I, I really do. I know some people, you know, haven't been as blessed as me with a great mother, but my mother is here today. And that means she's watching, right? <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding. Um, but, you know, th- there's one thing I love about my mom. And every time I talk about it, I'm just going to cry. Let's just be real. Um, there's one thing I love about my mom, and it's her steadfast uh, faithfulness to Jesus, you know, my mom and us, we've gone through a lot of things as, a, as our family, as, as all of us have. And, you know, one thing I look at my mom and I say that, it, that no matter what for her, when it was through thick and thin, when it was through trial and pain and through horrific moments, she never lost faith in Jesus. Like, ever. And I, I honestly truly believe that it was my mother's prayers that saved me when I was lying to her and stealing from her and partying with my friends in high school. I really do think it was my mother's prayers, her faithfulness to me as her son that saved my life. Because even when life for her was, at, was almost as bad as it can get, she kept praying, she kept faithful. Um, she kept trusting God and she saw so many miracles. If you ask my mom, you go to her, you're like, you ever need a miracle, go ask my mom. She's got um, like hundreds of miracles. Like it's unbelievable of just breakthrough and provision and it's unbelievable what God has done uh, in my mom's life. And, and I look at her and I think it's just so inspiring to me. I think all of us, we need to have people in our lives that we are inspired by their faith. Do you, do you have somebody in your life that inspires you to have faith that God's gonna come through? Do you have somebody in your life you can look at and say, wow, that's who I look to, knowing that God did it for them, I know he can do it for me too. I really wanna encourage you, we have to have people that we can look at who've kept the faith, who've kept on fighting, who are keeping on fighting, not giving up, and I think we all need somebody like that in our life. And, you know, when I look at her stories and I look at, you know, what God is doing just even across our world right now, it's pretty remarkable what God is doing in our world. If you're not paying attention, God is moving right now in miraculous, beautiful ways all over the world. We're hearing stories and stories. One thing when I look at, when I hear story of miracle, when I hear story of faithfulness, when I hear story of faith, you know what really boosts me is that it's the same God who did that for my mom will do that for me. Right? The same God who who did that for, for her can do it for you. The same God who brought healing can bring healing to you. The same God who brings provision can bring provision to you. I truly, truly believe this. And I believe that as a country or as a, as a, as a church anyway, we're stepping into a season where God's gonna start to break some things wide open. Like God's gonna start to do something powerful. And like, I'm just sitting back waiting for what God's gonna do. It's, I'm so excited. I'm, I'm, I'm expectant on what he's gonna do. And I really have believe, you know, as I was, you know, preparing this morning and as I was praying and I was thinking about today, I just really kept thinking God's going to do something today. And so I'm just going to open in prayer and then I'm just going to share what God has placed in my heart um, for us as a church. Uh, But Father, we thank you. First of all, that you are the same God, that what you did in the Bible, you're still doing today. You're still providing. You're still healing. And so God, today we call on you to do it again in our lives. And God, help me speak your words, not mine. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're gonna continue our series. Started last week, same God. We talked about uh, Jacob and how God is the God of generations and God is the God of covenant. The same covenant that God gave to Abraham, it says in Galatians that, he, that we are inherited as well. We're, we're a part of the bloodline, right? As we become followers of Jesus. Once we give our lives to Jesus, we gain this inheritance from the Father. It says that also in Ephesians, right? And so we get this from God. And that's what we talked about last week, that God is the God of covenant, that his promises are, uh, uh, don't lay dormant, but his promises are always the same and he always will follow through as well as he's the God of generations. And today I wanna talk about Moses. Now, you know the stories of Moses. Moses is known for a lot of miracles, right? If you look through his life, you see miracle after miracle, like really close with God, and he just see, you see things happen over and over and over again. Even from when he was young all the way through his life, even though he sometimes strayed away, even though sometimes he walked away, God still got a hold of him, and he changed an entire nation through Moses. And what I want to do today is I want to give us three of the miracles that God did um, for Moses and what I believe that he can do for us. 
and, and, and what we can learn from them. So three miracles today. And number one is the miracle of power. Now, if you remember, if, you, if you've read through this recently, you remember the plagues that, that God brought upon Egypt. Now, that is a very vast display of God's power, right? Like, it's a very vast display. Like, if you read it, it's pretty, to be honest, horrific. Like, it, there's a lot that went on that's, like, crazy. And, and it's like, like, I'm so grateful that I don't have, like, heaps of piles of frogs in my house, right? Like, I'm just grateful that's not my story. There's a lot of things that God did in this. And, and I always found it interesting when I think about the plagues. I'm like, they're very specific, right? Like, it's not like he just, like, made it dark for, like, a week and was like, okay, just let my people go. It was 10 different things that he did. And there's a really specific reason as to why he did each and every one of these things. It's how this week I was studying, I was researching, I was looking into it. Like, wh like why these plagues? And the Ted plagues of Egypt, I think each one of them had a specific purpose. And the main purpose, obviously, was to prove uh, to Egypt and prove, prove to Israel that God was real. To show that, that God had power. That the gods that Egypt had were not the real gods. That God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right, that he was the real God. And so these plagues were to kind of prove and show his power. And then also to set the people free, right? To change Pharaoh's heart so that way he would let the people go. These ten different plagues. And when I was looking at it this week, you know, at, in ancient Egypt, they worshipped over 1,400 gods. And I know what you're thinking, because this is what I thought. I'm like, I sometimes struggle to worship one god, let alone 1,400, right? Like sometimes, like, I, like sometimes I forget to pray. But 1,400 different gods that, that Egypt had at this time, and Pharaoh was one of these. He was worshipped, and he was seen as, as a god. So even their ruler, their leader, was a god. They had 1,400 different gods at the time. And each of these plagues, very interesting, was a judgment and a response to one of these gods that they had. And so I want to read this, and this is in Exodus chapter 7. And I want to encourage you to read through this this week if you have some time. Exodus 7 and all the way through. But this is what it says. This is when, when, he, when, when Moses goes uh, to, to Pharaoh. He says this. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Pharaoh will demand, show me a miracle. And when he does this, say to Aaron, take your staff and throw it down in front of Pharaoh, and it will become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did what the Lord had commanded them. Aaron threw down his staff before Pharaoh and his officials, and it became a serpent, exactly what God has said. Then Pharaoh called in his own wise men and his own sorcerers and his own magicians, and these Egyptian magicians did the same thing with their magic. They threw down their staffs, which also became serpents, but then Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. And Pharaoh's heart, however, remained hard, uh, he refused to listen just as the Lord had predicted. So this is kind of the start of this moment where he throws down his staff, turns into a snake, but then Pharaoh's like, yeah, guess what my guys can do? And he's like, we're gonna have more snakes than you. We're gonna have more serpents than you. And then all of a sudden, their serpents and their, their, their staffs are getting eaten. Like, just like imagine you're there, right? Pharaoh's like, hey, turn your, 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 your staffs into snakes. Like, okay, they do, and then they get eaten. They're like, now I don't have my staff, man. Right, like, how am I supposed to do this again? You ate my, my only thing that I have. You ate it, right? But I want to go through these 10 plagues because it's very interesting. This, this is the start of the story where, where Pharaoh calls in his men to do the exact same thing that God does, right? And it's interesting right here that they do it, right? That they, they actually succeed in actually doing the same thing that God did. So, of course, Pharaoh's like, you and what army, right? Like, guess what? My guys are stronger than yours. I got more than you. They may have eaten my staff, but I can carve some new ones, and I'll use your slavery power to do it. Right? So this is this moment, and we're going to go through the ten plagues, and, and I want to go quick because there's a lot in this, but the first plague was the plague of blood, right? The turning the Nile River blood, and this was a judgment against one of their gods who was the god of the Nile, and another god who was the goddess of the Isle, and then another one who was the guardian of the Nile. So against these three different gods, and so what God did is the river, this river, the Nile, it was used to brought, bring life to Egypt doing, do, sorry, <laughs> during its year of, it's, it's yearly flooding. It would bring life to the land, right? And so that's what would happen. And every year this, this would bring life. And so the Nile was really the river of life for Egypt at the time, right? They're in the desert, right? So the, 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 the river of life, really, for them. And so what happened is God turned the source of life into a source of death as millions of fish died and, they, and the drinking water became unstable, so really in response to what, these, what they worship, these gods of the Nile, God says, guess what? You're gods of the Nile, I'm more powerful than them. 
And I can actually do more than them. You want to see what I can do? But it's interesting because Pharaoh calls his guys again and they do the exact same thing. Right, they do it again. And so, and we go to the next one. This is the one of the frogs. And this was a judgment against one of their gods who was a frog-headed goddess and it was the goddess of birth. And in that time, frogs were thought of to be sacred and were spared at all costs in this time. And so what God did is he used frogs to invade people's homes and as, as they died, their bodies heaped in piles throughout the land. Millions of frogs. So this was God in response to another goddess, the goddess of birth, which was for the frogs. And so God said, you know, you're a goddess of, that looks like a frog. Well, all the frogs are going to die. They're going to be in piles heaping around the land, right? So God looks, says, you can do this, right? And so, so then the guy, Pharaoh's guys, right, they, they try and they do it again. And then we go to number three here. It's, it's the one of the gnats. And this was a judgment against the god of the desert. And unlike the other plagues so far, Pharaoh's magicians couldn't copy this. Right, so they couldn't actually make this happen. So all of a sudden, they're like, they're like whoa, what's happening? Like, these, these guys are actually more powerful. Whoever they worship is actually more powerful than what we're even capable of. And then number four uh, was the flies, right? And this was the judgment uh, of the fly god that they had at the time. And this is the first plague. It's so interesting. This is the first plague that God differentiated between the Israelites and the Egyptians. As no swarms of flies were around the, where the Israelites lived, right? So all of a sudden, when you get to four, all of a sudden, there's a big differentiation between what God is doing to, to Israel and what God is using for Egypt. They're starting to separate. And then we go to the next one, which is livestock. It says, this was a, uh, this was a judgment uh, on one of their gods who, was, uh, was, uh, who they were depicted as cows. Two of these gods that they had depicted as cows. And all of the cattle of the Egyptians died, right? All of them. And none of the Israelites' cattle died. And at this point, Pharaoh, right, he's like, what's going on? So he sends out some people into the land and realizes, whoa, Israel's not having the same things happen to them. It's not happening anymore. So what's happening? Like, like why is this happening to us? They start to investigate, and they, they realize something's, something's off here. And the next one is this one of the boils, right? If you remember, the one of the boils. And this was a judgment against several of their gods, which was over health and disease. And, and boils, disease covered, boils and disease covered Egypt, right? All of them. And it even says this, and I find this so interesting. In Exodus 9, 11, I don't have it, but it says this. Even the magicians, so Pharaoh's magicians, were unable to stand before Moses because the boils had broken out on them and all the Egyptians. So they couldn't even be present anymore. So what God is saying here is like, like you think you're healthy? Guess what I can do? I can actually make you incapable of battle. I can actually make you incapable of this. You know your gods that, 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 that you have that do this? Guess what? I'm stronger than them. I'm better than them. Those magicians, they can't even come into my presence anymore because of what I've done. And then we go to the next one, right? The hail. And this is the plague, which, which was the judgment against the, the, the sky goddess that they had. And the, co- and the crop god that they have and the storm god that they had. And it came with fire and everything along the ground was devastated. All their crops, right, was devastated. And then number eight, locusts. Again, uh, this was focused on three more of their gods. And everything that survived the hail was now devoured by the locusts. And there would be no harvest for Egypt this year. He's like, guess that provision, the, the river that used to come, that's blood. Get, like, like, look what I can do with all of your resources, all of your stuff. I can give and I can take away. This is what he's saying. He says, you know, they had no crop anymore. And then this one right here, this uh, was nine, which is the darkness, right? And this plague was aimed at, at the sun god, and he was symbolized by Pharaoh, right? So the, actually the guy. And for three, j- three days, Egypt was covered in darkness. But the homes of Israel had light. And then number 10, the death of the firstborn was a judgment against the protector of children, their god, the protector of children. And in this plague was also a lesson, if you remember, for Israel that pointed to Jesus who would be coming thousands, hundreds and hundreds of years later. These are the 10 plagues. And the gods of Egypt, if you research it, what God is saying, he's like, the gods you have are no match for me. You think that you're, you're the god of light, Pharaoh? I'm gonna make it dark. I have the power to bring life, light, and I have the power to bring darkness. And I think for all of us, if we look through our own life, we need to realize that God is capable. God is powerful. You know, all 1,400 of the Egyptians' gods were no match for our one God. And if you think about it, you know who our God is? God, our God is the protector of children. Right? Our God is the God of light. He spoke and things were created. He's the God of creation. He's the God of provision. He's the God of healing. He's the God who can give and take away. That's who we serve. And he showed Egypt, he said, you are no match for me. What I am capable of. And I think when you look at it, their situation seemed impossible. 
right? They had been in slavery. They were being overworked. They were, they were hungry. Like there was a lot happening for them and they were really desperately, really, really struggling. And then God shows up and goes, look how powerful I am. Look what I'm about to do in your life. Miracle after miracle after miracle. It's dark in the land, but Israel had light. The swarms of flies didn't come to them. Their cattle survived. Like God was moving in a powerful, powerful way. Our God is the true God of life and death. Death. And of light and of health and of creation and of beauty and of the sky and of the earth. That's who we serve. And he's still on the throne. And we need to start acting like he's still on the throne. The power that, you, that, that, that God did this, it's still, it's still alive today, right? It says the power that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of us. Those who us who give our lives to Jesus. Yet some of us are walking around as if we have no power. We're walking around as so timid. We're like, I don't even know if I want to share Jesus with my neighbor. Because what if they, what if they hate me? It's like, we need to start walking in the courage that miracles bring and the faith that miracles can bring. That same power lives in us today. We need to start actually acting like it and start walking as if we have that power. Even Pharaoh, who was considered a God, was no match for the true God. And in Psalm 103, and I want you to never forget this, Psalm 103, 19 says this, the Lord has made the heavens he has made the heavens his throne, and there he rules over everything. Everything he rules over. You know, he doesn't just rule over your business. He doesn't just rule over your family. He doesn't just rule over our church. He rules over everything. That is who we serve. When, when, uh, what you are looking, when you are looking for breakthrough, it might seem insurmountable what's in front of you. It might seem so challenging and it might seem so tough and it probably is. As we know as human beings, life is hard. Life isn't always easy. Life isn't always spectacular. Sometimes life is mundane and boring when we just go through the motions and we're like, I don't know if I can keep on going, but we have to know who our God is and what he is capable of. Matthew 19, 26 says this, Jesus looked at them intently. And said, humanly speaking, it is impossible. But with God, everything is possible. Do you know what's impossible? The, the situation in front of you is impossible if you try to do it on your own. Yeah, the debt you have, you're probably not going to be able to pay it off by yourself. The situation in front of you might seem impossible, but with God, everything is possible. Everything. 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 What you're going through, I know it seems hard and it really is hard, but bring God into it and then peace will come and it will replace panic. Let God's peace reign over you. The same God who proved his power then can do it again today. The same God who brought the miracles then today, his, he is still powerful today. He is still working today. He is still moving the, today. The problem that you have, the pain, the fear that you're experiencing, it's not news to him. It's not like he's surprised by it. It might break his heart, but it doesn't surprise him. He says, trust me. Right? Do you know what, what some of the most painful words God says to, to me is? Trust me. <laughs> right? Like, I'm like, yeah, but like, give me a sign, right? Like, prove it. He's like, trust me. I'm like, all right. So sometimes, I don't know if you feel like this, but I'm, I feel like, I'm standing on the edge of a cliff with a bungee cord, and he's like, jump. I'm like, no chance, bro. He's like, just do it. I'm like, no. He's like, trust me. I'm like, but it's just an elastic band. Like, I'm not going to be okay. He's like, trust me. You know, the, the hardest words for him to say is trust me, but the most freeing words are also trust me. Because then we give up, and we say, God, I trust you, and I'm going to take the step. Even though it's dark, even though it's scary, even though it's painful, I'm going to walk into what's next for me. And I trust you with my future. Trust him with your life. That's what we have to do. Understand his power, but then trust him to follow through. Your life gains meaning in the capable hands of God. Right? God proved his power through these 10 plagues. And he really proved his power in a, more, a bigger way than I think even we fully get. Like he was proving to Egypt, your gods mean nothing. Like literally nothing. Like you're, you're Pharaoh, the guy you worship, the guy who's your leader, it's dark now. His power is gone. If you read through the scriptures, you'll see moment after moment of God showing humanity his love and his power. 
And it off, it's often when people's hearts were hardened towards them. Oftentimes you see this hardened towards them and he starts to show up in, in mighty and powerful ways. So that's number one. Miracle number two is the miracle of a way. You know, I think this is the most iconic moment in Moses' story. And I think, you know, we see this moment, you know, when he stands over the sea and parts and they walk across on dry land, right? The most powerful moment in Moses' life. You know, there's one time uh, I went to, uh, my family's from Montreal. And so we went to Montreal and we decided one day we were going to go to Quebec City. If you ever been to Quebec City, such a beautiful city. Old, like if you feel like you're in Europe, like the old roads and like, it's beautiful. But... Um, I, was, I was asked to drive while we were in Quebec City. Now, one thing you need to understand about Quebec City is that it's not English, right? And so every sign is not in English. I, and I'm not, I don't speak French. My family's French. I know how to say bonjour, right? Like that's like my, like, that's my, like the limit of my capabilities. I speak more Spanish than French, like for real. And so it's, it's and then it's dark all of a sudden, right? So it's like, it's dark. It's, it's French. And then it's literally downpouring like pouring rain, like a torrential downpour. Like, I'm not joking. Like, I, I don't know if I've ever seen a storm this bad, right? And so I'm driving, and just real quick, I was driving in a standard car for the first time in like six years, right? And if you've ever been to an old city, the roads are kind of small. Like, they're, they didn't think about the big cars we have today when they made them, right? And so Beth and I were like, I know, we're looking for parking. So we, we see and we're like, oh, perfect, turn right here. We turn right, we get down the dead end, it's a hill like this. I'm not, like, I'm not kidding you. Like, this is a true story. And so it's pouring rain, it's pitch black. I'm in a manual car like this, have to reverse back up a hill in pitch black, it's French. Beth's crying, I'm crying. Like, I'm telling you, I don't know if I've been more stressed out. This is a true story. Like, we're so stressed out, we're so stressed out. I'm trying to reverse up. I may have wrecked the clutch. I'm not sure yet. I don't know. But I, so I stall. I'm like going backwards. We're so panicked. We're so freaked out. And we're just going and we're going. And all of a sudden, finally we make it up. And I just like, I think, I don't even remember that part because I think I was just so much stress. I think I probably laughed or cried again. I don't remember. I may have screamed for joy. Like, like I don't know. That's one of the scariest moments because I'm trying to reverse up. Anyway, you know, you know, my, you know the stress and pain I'm feeling. But the thing is about God is that no matter what situation we find ourselves in, there's always a way out. You know what's so powerful about God? Even if we're the one who dug the hole, there's still a way out. He'll throw us the rope. You know, and oftentimes the situations we find ourselves in, do you know who put us there? Ourselves. Oftentimes. Not always, of course. But oftentimes, the decisions we make, the choices we make, we're just digging a hole, we're, and God's like, hey, I'm right here. Like, we're like, no, give me a minute. Wait till I'm 30, right? And keep going, like... We just keep digging the holes. Like, no, there's always, 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 always a way out for you. I truly believe this. And this is what exactly what Israel experienced in Exodus 14, verse 21. It says this. Then Moses raised his hand over the sea, and the Lord opened up a path through the water with a strong east wind. The wind blew all night, turning the seabed into dry land. So the people of Israel walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground with walls of water on each side beautiful you know oftentimes the obstacle in front of us becomes the pathway to get to where we're going I think oftentimes we we try and go around right we try and make our own way we're like well let me craft a boat first I know yeah let's let's build an ark right let's try and build an ark maybe that'll work right we always try and make our own way around God's like yo trust me God makes a way always when there is no way do you know what a lot of us were experiencing right now? A situation where we feel like there's no way out. We feel like we're trapped. We feel like we're stuck. We feel like we can't keep going. We feel like we can. God's like, trust me, there is a way. I'm about to create a way in the middle of the wilderness, right? I'm about to make a way in the middle of the sea. And Isaiah 43 says this, verse 16 and 19. I am the Lord who opened a way through the waters, making a dry path through the sea. I called forth mighty, the mighty chariots of Egypt with all of its chariots and horses. I drew them beneath the waves, and they drowned. Their lives snuffed out like a smoldering candle wick. But forget all that. It is nothing compared to what I'm going to do. For I am about to do something new. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? 
I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers through the dry wasteland. He says, but forget all that. Why? Because what's about to come is even more powerful. The way, the situation in front of you, the sea in front of you, the mountain in front of you, just sit back and watch what God's about to do. He says, do you not see it? And some of us, we don't see the way. Why? Because we're trying our, our hardest to make our own way. We're not even looking and paying attention to what God is saying to us. God says, do you not see it? I am making a way in the middle of the most horrific, horrible situation. I am making a way out. Do you trust me to do it? You know, I know your situation is unbearable. I know you might feel like there's no light at the end of the tunnel. You just feel like you're walking in complete darkness. All you see around you is water and no land in sight. I know that's where a lot of us are right now. And this is at where Moses writes, right? He's at a crossroads. Turn back. See, he's here. What do we do? Turn back. I'm for sure going to die. Through me, it became dark and I killed the Pharaoh's son. Like, not a good look for me. Turn back or face what's in front of us. What would you do? Some of us, the past, even as painful as it was, is more attractive than the future. Why? Because we've already put in the work in the past, right? Like, that was, I was tired after I did that. I don't want to do it again. Exodus 14. As Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up and panicked when they saw the Egyptians overtaking them. They cried out to the Lord and they said to Moses, why did you bring us out of, out of here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you that this would happen while we were still in Egypt? We said, leave us alone. Let us be slaves to the Egyptians. It's better for us to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. You know, the way that God creates might not be beautiful. The way out might not be a ladder into the heavens. It's going to be hard. And I think these questions are the same questions we ask. Really, they're, they're asking Moses, but they're really asking God. Why did you bring us here to die? What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Why did you make me leave my job there? This is way harder. Why did you make me go through this? Why, did, why, why are you taking me away? Why, 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 God? We have that question a lot. Why? We all want to know why. Then 13, verse 13, Moses said to told the people, don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch. <laughs> Don't do anything. The Lord will rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. Again, they were still alive. They got crushed by the waves. But verse 14, the Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. You know, you know they're sending an army. You can imagine the ground shaking as horses and chariots and people are coming. And they're trapped. They don't have, like, they're trapped. Like, there's no way. You know, they feel their enemy is inches away from taking their life, moments away. But this is what Moses says. Stay calm. You know, the best thing to do when there's chaos, the best thing to do when you don't know what to do, the best thing to do when fear is present, the best thing to do when you're in a situation or a circumstance that you hate, Stay calm. The best thing to do when you get a tough diagnosis, breathe. And know that God's got you. He has you. He's got you. He will never leave you or forsake you. Even if you run away. Even if your faith is little and your fear is great. Breathe. 
He's still working today. He's still moving today. You know, the problem or the pain, the fear that you're experiencing, he wants to be a part of it. And that's the thing I don't, I don't really understand why, but God says, I want to be, I want to carry that for you. Like, if you really think about it, like, who does that? Like, who, who, who as a leader, as a God, as a ghost, and says, I'm going to carry that for you so that you don't have to? And all he says to do, he says, don't even lift a finger. Just breathe. Stay calm. Breathe. He's still working today. And I believe that God is still in the business of making a way out of a situation. And our, our role, our responsibility is to, to stay steadfast and faithful and keep on going. James 1, 2, 1, 12, right? Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. You know, storms and trials will come. You know, they're just a part of being a human being. The storms will come, right? Even the first of some of the plagues, right? Egypt experienced, or Israel experienced them. The storms are coming. You know, what gave Moses faith was not what he saw in front of him, but who he saw do it, right? It wasn't the, the, the problem. Some of us, our focus is so much on the pain, the problem, that our eyes are never even on Jesus. And he's like, just look at me. Like, lift your eyes for a second. When Israel turned to Moses in their distress, Moses turned to God. When the world turns to you and says, what do we do? You say, I'm gonna go ask God real quick, right? Let me go check with the big man upstairs and I'll let you know what we're gonna do, right? The miracle of the way comes through God. It does not come through you. And then the last miracle I want to go through today is this, is the miracle of victory. You know, the Egyptians, that was just the start, right? Like, if you read through it, like, that was just the start. And that was a pretty epic start. Like, like you're in a cart, or you're walking with your fam, and you're just walking, there's just sea turtles swimming beside you on each side, and you're like, this is interesting. Epic story, right? But this was just the start of what they did. Like, if you read through it, it's absolutely incredible. So many battles they, that the Israelites walked through and so many victories. And this is Exodus 17, verse 11 to 13. And this is when uh, Israel is in a battle with the Amalekites. It says this, as soon as Moses held up the staff in his hand, the Israelites had the advantage. But whenever he dropped his hand, the Amalekites had gained the advantage. Moses' arms soon became so tired he could no longer hold them up. So Aaron and Hur found a stone for him to sit on. And they stood on each side of Moses holding up his hands so that so his hands held steady until sunset. As a result, Joshua overwhelmed the army of Amalek in the battle. Like there's, there's so much in this. But God is the God of victory. Like he is. And I know the battle in front of you, one thing I can promise you, the battle in front of you, it's gonna require a fight. And it might not be fighting with your fists, it might be fighting with your soul. It might be fighting with your heart. I heard this once, it says this, you're either entering a storm, you're in the middle of a storm, or you're on your way out of a storm, right? It's human life. Storms and battles are a part of being broken in a, or human, being human in a broken world. And we can either pray for the storm to not exist, or we can pray for the strength to keep on fighting. You might say, but I'm so exhausted. Ask for help. In this battle, Moses, he knew what he had to do, but he wasn't capable of doing it by himself. Have you ever tried to hold your arm up for more than like a minute? It's like, it's tough. Like a staff too. He, he must have had some massive shoulders, right? Like he must have been like pretty tough. And so he did, what he does is he gathers his closest friends and says, hold my arms up. We're going to win this battle today. Not 
by ourselves, but together. The three of us, we're going to go and we're going to fight this battle. Where? Holding our hands up. When the situation in front of you seems so hard, do not stop praising Jesus. When the battle in front of you seems so painful, when the situation in front of you seems so hard, do not stop worshiping our Father. And what's interesting, when Moses parted the sea, he lifted his hands in the air. And when he has this battle, his hands have to stay in the air. Why? Because that's how we fight our battles, is by worshiping our Creator, worshiping our King, worshiping our Savior. That's how we fight our battles. With our hands lifted high, sometimes we feel like, I can't hold my arms up anymore. Have you ever felt that way? It's because you weren't supposed to. The beauty of church, the beauty of a family is we come together and we hold up each other's arms when we can't by ourselves. When we, when we, we were sitting there, we're so broken and so alone. We say, God, I need you, but I need people to fight with me. Who is holding your arms up when you can't fight anymore? You know, oftentimes the miracle, oftentimes the victory, you need other people. God could have chosen anything to bring this victory, right? He had already called, made it dark. He'd already brought locusts. He'd already killed cattle. Like, he could have just brought down fire, boom, battle's done. No, he said, no. How it's going to happen is we're going to do it together. He could have used any of those plagues. But I want to tell you right now, God is still protecting now. God is still providing now. God is still proving now. God is still healing now. God is still winning now. It didn't just happen yesterday. It's going to happen today and it's going to happen tomorrow. And we fight from a place of victory with our arms raised high. We say, God, I trust you and this battle is already won. Hebrews 11 one says this, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. You might not have seen it yet keep on believing you might not feel it yet keep your arms up you might feel alone look around you who's holding up your arms right now faith is our assurance in the things we hope for we might not see it but that doesn't mean it's not happening again Moses he held up his arms the the wind comes and starts to part the sea all night the winds are going and going Sometimes it doesn't happen in a moment. Sometimes it takes some time. When we feel as if everything is in chaos and turmoil and fear are so present, what do we do? Again, we just lift up. We say, God, I trust you. I praise you. Why? Because you are good. Because I trust you because you are good. Lift up your hands and worship our King. He is still on the throne. He is still good. He is still beautiful. He's still powerful today. He's the same God that what he did for Moses, he can do again. And we're going to close our service with a song. I want to encourage you to stand with us. And we're going to sing two songs, actually. We're going to sing one, and then we're going to sing a little bit of another one. But I want to read you what this, what this bridge says. It's a song called Same God. It says this. It says, you heard your children then, you hear your children now. You answered prayers back then, you still answer now. You were providing then, you're providing now. You moved in power then, God move in power now. You were a healer then, you are a healer now. You were a savior then, you are a savior now. It's the same. I don't know what you need from God this morning. I don't know what you're going through, but I want to encourage you as a family today, let's worship our King together. Let's stand with our arms lifted high, no matter what, what's going on at home, no matter what's going on at work, no matter what's going on. We say, God, I praise you today. God, I trust you today. Maybe you're in need of provision, or maybe you need protection. Maybe you need some salvation. I don't know what you need. The same God who brought it then will bring it now. Do you believe it? Do you believe he is the same God? Do you believe that what he did for them, he can do for you?